John chapter 2, so open your Bible there, please. John chapter 2, we're going to be picking it up in verse 12, so follow along with me as I read. John 2, 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changer sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. Let's pray. Father, open our hearts to your word this morning, to your spirit, as you speak to each person, and open our hearts to hear your voice, the message that you have for us today. Guide us, we pray. Direct our hearts, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, amen. This passage begins really kind of talking about the fact that uh, Jesus and, and his disciples uh, went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And this is interesting. This is the first of three mentions of Passover uh, that John gives us or records for us in this account. And you'll notice, and this is kind of a side point, kind of, sort of. But in case you've ever wondered, you might notice that, that John says that Jesus and his disciples went up to Jerusalem. Now that might be confusing if you know that they were in Capernaum and you know that Capernaum is north of Jerusalem. And so you're kind of thinking, wait a minute, why would they go up to Jerusalem if they had to travel south? Because they did, they had to travel south. Well, the reason for that is because Jerusalem is higher in elevation than is Capernaum or really any area of Galilee. And so that's the reason that they would talk about going up and down related to elevation, not north and south. So it says that they gathered together there for Passover. And when we say they gathered, you know, there are some Bible scholars who believe that when you take all of the pilgrims who would gather to Jerusalem for a particular feast, coupled with all of the Jews who lived in the city, it would come to over two million people. That's amazing. In fact, some say like two and a quarter million people. Um, and so there's a lot of people there and there's a lot of activity going on. The problem with a lot of the people who came from a distance is that they would be required to pay the temple tax. Every, every household had to pay that tax, but most of the people were bringing in foreign currency, which the temple didn't accept. Therefore, you needed the services of a money changer to convert your foreign currency to the local currency so that you could pay it. And therefore, there was the need for these money changers. In addition to that, uh, we have this is issue of people wanting to offer a sacrifice. But many people traveled from such a long distance, they couldn't bring an animal with them. It was just too costly or it would slow them down. Or the other issue was you'd bring an animal from home if you came from a long distance, and there was no guarantee that the priest would accept that animal for sacrifice. So you might go to all the effort and expense to bring an animal and the priest would reject it. So the easiest thing to do was just bring your money, buy an animal there in Jerusalem for sacrifice, and bing, bang, boom, you can get the thing you know, taken care of. Well, this is what's happening in the temple courts uh, and in, in the outer 
courts. And, and, and this, is, this is where this is happening. And you need to understand about the outer courts because this is, this is significant. The outer courts of the temple was also called the court of the Gentiles. And the reason they called it that was because that was the only place the Gentiles could go. That's as close as they could get. If you were a Gentile, a God-fearer, they called them, the Jews called them. In other words, a Gentile who worshiped the one true God, you could come to the outer courts of the temple and no further. And so this was where you would come to pray. This is where you would come to worship and so forth, where you would come to offer your sacrifice. But the Jews decided that it was in that very place that they were gonna set up a market for the money changers and the people who were selling animals. And that was really one of the big issues. It wasn't just that they were turning the house of the Lord into a marketplace. That was bad enough, but they were infringing upon the only place of worship that these Gentiles could come. And so uh, we see verse 15, which is the uh, recording of the response that our Lord had to all this. Look with me again in your Bible. Verse 15 says, in making a whip of cords. So this tells you that he didn't just kind of have this flash anger, you know, which people have from time to time. They see something happening, and they just kind of, ah. he took the time to take some, some twine or whatever it was. And he, he, he made this thing into a, a, a kind of a whip. And he, uh, it says he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And furthermore, he went over to the money changers and he poured out their coins, literally overturning their tables, you know. And he told them who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And as shocking as that whole event probably was for the people there, because this had been going on for a long time, it really shouldn't have been shocking, frankly. I mean, not if they were really thinking. Because one of the things that we forget about Passover, because personally, I've never celebrated a Passover. I have read about it a lot. But one of the things I think we Gentiles forget about as it relates to how Passover was celebrated was they had to go through this process of cleansing before Passover began anyway. And what they would do is they would cleanse the yeast and, or the leaven out of their homes. And they had to go through and search to see if there was any yeast or, or leaven, whatever you want to call it, in their home. And the reason they had to get rid of it before Passover is because throughout the course of the Old Testament, yeast was a symbol of sin. And so in order to celebrate, truly celebrate the Passover, they had to go through this process. So, so you know, God had commanded them to remove all of the yeast and, and, and getting rid of it depicted the act that we know in the New Testament as putting off the old sinful nature. That's what Paul calls it. He makes reference to it in that way. And frankly, for the Jews, it was very similar to the picture of circumcision. Circumcision also was a picture of putting off the flesh, cutting away the flesh, right? So God had given them this idea, this, these pictures, these, these pictures that related to getting rid of sin. So technically what Jesus was doing when he, when he barged into this area and started driving out the animals and the people selling them and also turning over the tables of the money changers was he was kind of just keep doing what was in keeping with the theme of Passover, which was essentially getting rid of sin. But see, the Jews didn't see it that way. There were certain areas that they'd overlooked. And isn't it interesting? And I, I, I just, I find it interesting that God had spoken to the Jews about getting rid of sin during Passover, using, of course, the picture of getting rid of yeast, but they didn't translate it. They didn't go beyond. For them, it was getting rid of yeast. And they forgot what it was all about. They forgot the meaning, the message, the root you know, of what they were supposed to be doing. Oh, this is a picture of getting rid of sin. So what they ought to have been doing was thinking through their lives about what they're doing and whether or not the Lord accepts what they were doing, you know. Isn't it interesting? They go through all these processes of, of fulfilling their religious demands 
And yet, at the same time, they're making plans to set up shop in the outer courts of the temple. So that, you know, there's all this buying and selling going on. And they, they completely missed the point of what getting rid of yeast was supposed to signify. And I'll be honest with you. I don't think that the Jews had a corner on that particular issue or limitation. We've, we've, we've talked so many times over our study of the Old Testament, how God would confront the nation of Israel for being religious. In other words, fulfilling their religious requirements while at the same time excusing themselves from immoral behavior. And we can do the same. We can do the same. And that's one of the reasons David would regularly bring his heart to the Lord, not just his offerings. Lord, search me and know me, he say. I've brought that up many times to you, but it's just such a powerful passage. Search me and know me, Lord. See if there be any wicked way. In other words, he's kind of saying, you know, I invite you to go through my cupboards, my pantry, see if there's any yeast that I've kind of overlooked. Maybe there's some sin in my life that I wasn't even really totally aware of. And I invite you, I invite you. That's bold, isn't it? That's bold. Verse 17 goes on to tell us that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Where that was written was in the Psalms, specifically Psalm 69, where David had written that statement. But the disciples remembered that David was a prophet. Jesus said so. And he had predicted the consuming passion of Messiah for the house of the Lord. And they were seeing it now in real time. But the response of the Jews, you'll notice, was quite different. Verse 18, the Jews just kind of bellied right up to Jesus when this happened. And they, they demanded that he show them a sign. They said, what, what sign do you show us for uh, doing these things? In other words, they're demanding some miraculous sign to prove his ability or his authority, rather, not ability. His authority to go into the temple and to do uh, what he did. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, there's, there's an amazing prophecy in, in the book that we're about to start on Wednesday night. You know, this coming Wednesday, we're starting our study of the last book of the Old Testament. And then we're going to be finished with our third time through the Old Testament. But we'll start in Malachi. And there's a very amazing passage in Malachi. I want to show you on the screen from chapter one, or excuse me, chapter three, verses one through four, it says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. This passage in Malachi has shades of fulfillment in both the, the event that we're reading about here in John chapter 2 and also in the future return of Jesus Christ, where he will come and purify the temple and purify the worship of Israel on that day. But he began that work in his first coming when he purified or cleansed the temple, not just once, but twice. You know, it's interesting. John's the only one who gives us this this event in the beginning of Jesus's public ministry. The other gospel writers do it at the end. So there was a second time that Jesus cleansed uh, the temple, which really, you know, and, and so we look at this in light of this prophecy that is given in Malachi, which Jesus partially fulfilled at that time. And when you look at it that way, you see that cleansing the temple was in itself proof that he was uh, Messiah, which of course the Jews were already ignoring. And so they sought another sign. 
kind of interesting. I, I've often thought to myself, well, I wonder what would have happened if Jesus would have accommodated them. You know, what if he, what if he you know, they said, we, what sign will you show us, you know? They might not have liked the sign they got, you know? It's like, okay, well, if you guys drop dead, I'm the Messiah. But, he, you know, he didn't do that, obviously. He didn't show any kind of a sign at, 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 at that specific time. But what if he had? What if he would have said, okay, fine. You know, pick somebody out of the crowd who's blind or deaf and healed them on the spot. Huh? Have you ever wondered what, what would have happened? Would the Jews, would, would they have said, well, there you go then. I guess he is. Are you kidding me? Jesus did do miracles in front of them. Casting out demons, healing the sick, causing the lame to walk. They saw plenty of those things. And on one particular time, when they could not deny the fact that a demoniac had been set free, their excuse was, well, he's obviously in league with Satan. That's what's going on. He's in, he's in cahoots with Satan. No big, there's, there's no big deal here. Just, you know. Yeah. If you want to explain it away, you will. It doesn't matter how many miracles you're shown. I don't know if you've ever prayed for somebody, you know, to come to Christ and said, Lord, show him a miracle. I'm not so sure that's the best prayer. Because, you know, if you want to explain something away, you'll explain it away. I don't care how miraculous it is. If you don't want to believe, you, you're not going to believe. And, and the Jewish religious leaders did not want to believe. It's not that they just didn't or that they hadn't seen enough evidence. They didn't want to. They refused. And that's the reason that Jesus didn't accommodate them uh, at the time. So they say, okay, you know, give us a sign. Look in verse 19. It says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, you know, this whole thing about 46, you know, the, the temple wasn't even completed at this time. They were, there's like 46 years up to this point, uh, but, but it still wasn't done. It wasn't completed fully. And then, so they're saying, you know, it's been 46 years since we started working on this thing and we're not even finished and you're going to raise it up in three days. Sure you are. But then we're told in verse 21, you know, that they'd completely misunderstood what he had said because he was talking about his body. So, you know, yeah, they misunderstood. <laughs> but we read the verse and we kind of go, well, now, wait a minute. Who wouldn't have misunderstood? It was ambiguous. I mean, the, the, what Jesus said to them was, was, it, was it was veiled, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was enigmatic, right? Raise, you know, destroy this temple. I mean, here they are just in the temple. So what are they supposed to think, you know? So once again, you know, you have that question. Why didn't Jesus just say it clearly? Why didn't he just say, all right, tell you what, here's the sign. Kill me, and in three days, I will raise myself from the dead. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, you have to admit. You know, there's nothing veiled or hidden or enigmatic about that statement. So why didn't he just say it that way? Why say it in a way that they, you know, weren't going to get? Well, you know, we talked about this. For those of you that have been around, we discussed this whole thing. We, we talked about how, you know, the, the, this, is, this is what was behind all the parables, all the stories, all the veiled references. We talked about how Jesus wants people to think deeply and to ponder what he's saying. Because Jesus knows that when you have a heart that longs to know the truth, you're gonna to wanna to look into it. You're gonna to seek to know more. You're gonna to desire to know more. But you know, those who are half-hearted and they don't really care, all they wanna do is argue. They're just gonna hear what they wanna hear anyway. And they're going to end up just being frustrated by what they do here. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's stupid. 
And you know, that's, sometimes that's what we run into when we're talking to unbelievers who, who uh, you know, read passages in the Bible but have really no desire to understand what it's saying. And so they, they, they quote a passage from the Bible and they say, well, you know, l listen to what it says here. This is ridiculous. This is stupid. And there were all kinds of times when people misunderstood. You know, we're going to get into further into John and he's going to, Jesus is going to say some pretty crazy things. Such as, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That is a tough thing to hear. And there are going to be people at that time who are going to go, okay, you just weirded me out. I'm, I'm done. And they're going to leave. Even though if they'd hung around long enough, they would have heard Jesus say, does this offend you? The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. The flesh counts for nothing. Now that explains it. But you see, if you don't stick around, if you don't listen, if you don't pay attention, and if you're half-hearted about trying to understand the Bible and what the Bible says, it's going to be a constant frustration to you. But if it's something that you are willing to dig into and open your heart to and seek to know, it, that God will open up the riches of wisdom and understanding to your heart. But it takes you have to have, having to have the desire, the drive to press in. No, I know there's more here. I know there's more to understand here. I'm not going to look at this thing on a superficial level. I'm going to dig in. I want to know. I want to understand what this says. And, and the Lord will accommodate you. We've, we've, we've talked about this before. Verse 22 says that, that when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered these things that he had said. And this again was in uh, Psalm 16 uh, concerning his resurrection. It says they remembered and they believed the scripture. Let me show it to you on the screen. And this is just one. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your holy one seek corruption. This is, this is part of what the disciples remembered after he was raised from the dead. And there were other scriptures. You know, there's Isaiah 53. There's, there's others that speak of the resurrection of Messiah. And it says that the, the, the disciples put those pieces together later. There was, a whole, there was a whole bunch of missing pieces to the picture for the disciples. Pretty much throughout the entire three years of his ministry. And they just, you know, good grief. It was, it, during the Last Supper, they were arguing about which of them was the greatest. There was so much they just didn't get. So much they didn't understand. But they came to an understanding. Verse 23 reminds us that Jesus did perform miracles while he was there during Passover. People and people were convinced of who he was, at least to some degree. Verse 23 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw. Right there. When they saw what? When they saw the signs that he was doing. John doesn't go into any kind of explanation of what he was doing. We can just assume he was healing people. You know? I mean, the usual stuff. And it says that the people believed in his name and and we really don't know what level of faith you know they came to we're not really sure but whatever it was john tells us in the last verse of the chapter that jesus on his part it says did not entrust himself to them and then he tells us why at the end of verse 24 it was because he knew all people and then and, and as i as i paraphrase verse 25 John basically says this, Jesus didn't need anyone telling him what was in the heart of man because he already knew what was in the heart of man. He didn't need anybody, you know, coming along and saying, okay, Jesus, let me, let me give you a little insight here on what's inside of a man. And when we say man, we're not using it as gender specific. Mankind. Jesus knew the heart of, of man as the creator. So what did he know? 
Well, it's outlined for us in Jeremiah. You guys know this. Jeremiah 17, 9 up on the screen. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. And God knows. He knows what's in the heart of man. And, and, and it is this condition of the heart that every one of us has to grapple with at some point. And I trust that here at Calvary Chapel, those of you who are here today and listening to me, I trust you've already grappled with this issue. And I mean grappled. I mean really dealt with this sort of a situation because it is this very reality that drives us to our knees, you know, and causes us to seek a savior. It is this. Otherwise, what in the world? You know, people come along and talk about, hey, man, you need Jesus as your savior. And, and today people are like, what for? Why? We just assume. We assume they already know. They don't know. People outside of Christ, most of them don't know because they have not grappled with this simple issue. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. What does the world say? Well, I just believe people are basically good. Okay. Have you heard that before? Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. I just, I just really believe in my heart that people are basically good. They're just basically good people. That just sounds so nice. Who wouldn't like to hear that? You're good. The Bible comes along and goes, no, you're not. You're the farthest thing from good. Your heart is desperately sick and deceitful above all things. Who wants to hear that? Isn't that just, we call this, by the way, the bad news, which you have to deal with in order to get to the good news. You, you, you know, we, we want to go around giving people the good news. They haven't understood the bad news. You're lost. Without God, without his help, without his mercy, you're lost. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that's, that's really, I, I, we've talked about this, you know, when, when, when Jesus was teaching the Beatitudes, which we looked at back in our study of Matthew, seems like a hundred years ago, we talked about those as steps to opening our heart, beginning to walk with the Lord. What's the very first Beatitude? What's the first step? Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who are bankrupt of self, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a blessed condition pronounced upon those who have grappled with their own sinful condition and recognized it and embraced it. Jesus says, you're blessed because now the kingdom of heaven is open to you. You know, when I'm talking to somebody who, who doesn't know Jesus yet, but they know for sure that they're a sinner, I want to say the same thing to them that Jesus said sometimes to people, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven because you, you're, you're on that first step. You just need to keep moving, <laughs> you know? But, but it, it's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, that's one of the reasons why Jesus said the way to life is narrow and hard. Those of us who have been saved for a while, we forget what it's like to address the issue of my depravity. I'm used to it now. I've, I've been doing it, you know, for a long time. And so for me, you know, when I sit down with somebody and I go, well, you're, you're a sinner and you know that, right? I forget that that's offensive. I forget because it's not offensive to me. It's just truth, you know, and, and it's not, it's not scary to me either because I know what to do with my sinful situation. I bring it to the cross. And I, even as a believer, I still have to bring my, my sinful heart to the cross. That's an ongoing thing. It's not that I keep getting saved. I got saved when I, when I first recognized that depravity and, 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 and came to the Lord and, and embraced him and received what he did for me on the cross. That's when I was saved. But I, that doesn't mean I don't, I, I, I'm done <laughs> bringing my, my sinful issues to, to him and to the cross. 
But, you know, so this narrow, this, this hard way that Jesus talked about, there, there are steps that you, you know, you gotta, you gotta get past. I mean, the first thing you gotta get past is this whole issue of admitting that your heart is deceitful and desperately sick. And again, that takes humility, right? You gotta be humble. No, I'm actually a good person, see? I've never cheated on my wife. I don't cheat on my taxes. I pay my taxes every year. I've never killed anyone. You ever notice how we always go to the biggies? Never killed anybody. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm a good guy, you know? <laughs> and we go, compared to what? Because see, that's the issue. When people start talking about how they're good, they're comparing themselves with other people. When the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short, it doesn't mean we've fallen short to the comparison of your neighbor. It means that you've sinned and fallen short with your comparison to the righteousness of God. And in that comparison, you know, our most righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And so we have to get past that, that first issue of admitting, yeah, that's me. When I, when I, when I hear about the, the worst of the worst things that people can do, I have to own it and say, that's me. My heart is capable of that. That's in my heart. It doesn't mean it's gonna, it has to come out. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna you know, act on it, but it's there. All of the ingredients are there. When I look at somebody who has walked in some area of just terrible sin, I, I have to say, I could do that. Given the right circumstances, I could do that just like they did. No, I'm not going to look down on them because my heart is the same. That's hard to do. And then next, you have to admit that there's nothing you can do to change your situation. How many times have you invited somebody to church and they said to you, well, when I kind of get my life together, then I'll start coming to church. And that's just kind of that, that attitude that says, well, I know I'm not where I should be, but I'm going to work on it. And it, which misses the whole point. Because there's at some point you have to say, I can't save myself. I can't be good enough. You know? And then finally, I have to admit that Jesus is my only hope for being saved. And, and by the way, that's narrow. You Christians, you guys are narrow. Well, yeah, the gospel is. You guys go around telling people that it's only Jesus. You gotta have Jesus. Well, actually, no, it's, he said that. We're only saying what he said. We happen, yes, we do believe it. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. I'm it. That's narrow. Oh, I believe that there's many ways to heaven. Well, that's a nice thing to say too, because you don't offend anybody. But Jesus went around defending people. He offended a lot of people, frankly. Whenever you go around saying, I'm the only way, in me is life. My words are life. Now, that can be offensive. But then again, he's God in human flesh. So, you know, the way to life is narrow, right? You just deal with it. It's narrow. It's hard. It's hard to get there. It's hard to get to the place to even you want to admit it. And then it's hard to say, I am helpless to do anything. So thankful that when we come to that place in our lives, Jesus is there and he says, finally, finally, now enter into the joy of your master. Let's stand together. I don't know if Jesus has been waltzing into the uh, outer courts of your heart and clearing things out that shouldn't be there. But, you know, if that's been going on, 
I want to encourage you to submit to it and just invite him to do his work, you know, because he does a good work in our lives. If you need prayer, we'll invite you after we're finished here to come on down front. We'd love to pray with you. Father, we thank you so much for the power and grace and wisdom that is in your word. And, and we just ask, Lord, that you would just continue during the course of the week to speak to our hearts and minister that grace to us, minister truth. Thank you, Lord. You are the truth. You are the only way. And we just confess that right now. We confess right now, Lord, my heart, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And Lord, I just confess that to you right now. And I confess, Lord, that I cannot do a single thing to change that situation, but you can. And not only, Lord, are you my only savior, but you are the one who can transform my heart and form in me the heart of Christ. And I pray that you would do that, Lord, more and more every day. Form Jesus in our hearts, Father. For we ask it in the name of your precious Son and all God's people said together, Amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Sunday.